Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath day. Just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and quite unable to stand up. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. And immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. Now the synagogue leader was indignant that Jesus had cured on the Sabbath. And so he kept saying to the crowds, there are six days on which work can be done. Come on one of those days to be cured, not on the Sabbath. But the Lord answered him, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie your donkey or your ox from the manger and lead it away to drink water? Why should not this woman, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, not be released from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he had answered, all his opponents were put to shame, but all the crowd was rejoicing for all the wonderful things he was doing. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. Christ. Grace and peace to you from the one who is our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. I don't have my sermon in order here, folks. So there's a rock song that came to my mind this week when I read the gospel, and I asked Brian if it were possible to do it at the second service. We're not doing it, so I guess not. It's called Hold Your Head Up. Does anybody know it? I don't think I can sing it this morning. I'm still froggy. Um, hold your head up, hold your head up, hold your head high. Do you know this? And it just keeps going over and over again, right? And if they stare, just let them burn their eyes on you moving. And if they shout, don't let it change a thing that you're doing. So I think this should be the theme song for the woman in today's gospel. A woman who for 18 long years has not been able to hold her head up. Not until Jesus says, woman, you are set free from your ailment. And he lays his hand, I imagine, on her back, the place of, shall we say, her shame. Only then is she able to stand up straight and praise God now, culturally, most of us, we bow our heads when we pray. But this woman helps us to understand why some people pray like this, with their faces raised and their arms outstretched. She went from being bowed over and down to looking up for the first time in almost two decades, able to raise her head up she wasn't going to bow it to pray now that she's able to hold it up high, to feel the rays of sunshine upon her cheeks, to catch snowflakes on her tongue. It does rain in our snow in Jerusalem, at least. Able to see who's around her, able to see how many are in the crowd, able to look others in the face, not having to rely on others bending over to acknowledge and see her. No longer dependent upon them caring enough to bend down and check out her perspective. How many people do you think did that? Or did they avoid her or talk over her bent back? 
Have you ever noticed how uncomfortable people, maybe we ourselves, are around those who are differently abled? Isn't that where shame often raises its ugly head and in doing so causes those differently able to lower theirs? There are, of course, many things that burden us, weigh on us, bend our backs, but it seems to me that shame is a big one. There's a great short video called Whale Eyes, you can Google it, that a boy did about his own eyes that don't work together. He sees out of one of them at a time, and so people don't know which eye to look at when talking to him, including his own family, his mom, dad, and brother, who are also in the video. He says, I have a visual disability, and I want you to look me in the eye. Google it. He tries not to shame his family and others for how they don't really see him and how they make him feel different. They could have even possibly made him feel ashamed, except for the fact that he's not letting that happen. He has held his head high, and as the rock song goes, and if they stare, just let them burn their eyes on you moving. He enters right into the center of the issue. He has agency, something the woman seems not to have. In the story, she has a physical ailment that physically bows her down. But I imagine, I imagine that it is accompanied by an emotional and mental bowing down as well. They so often go together. Think of a time you have been shamed in life. Shame is something that goes deep to our inner core. Embarrassment is something that might turn our face red for a second or two. Shame is something that makes us feel that we are wrong. Not that we said or did something wrong, but that we in our very being are wrong. People who are differently abled or who have kids who are differently abled know this place when somehow we are deemed not quite equal to others. The posture of shame is downcast eyes, bowed head, bent shoulders, curved inward, trying to make ourselves smaller or even disappear. We, we want to hide. Who among us has not felt that desire to disappear, to hide like Adam and Eve, not only from one another, but even from God? Shame is connected to being both excluded and to experiencing unwanted exposure. Like the woman in the story, she couldn't pass through the synagogue crowd unnoticed. She and her ailment were there exposed for all to see, and yet she was most certainly excluded from the community for fear that she was contagious, for suspicion that her ailment reflected God's displeasure for her discomfort her condition caused others? Think of all the things in our lives that can evoke shame. Being compared to a sibling and continuing to negatively compare yourself to them, maybe even now. Being scolded for making a mistake and internalizing the message that you were bad. Making a mistake that resulted in someone else being hurt and not forgiving yourself being bullied in school for how you look or some other trait you become ashamed of, receiving love that feels conditional upon your performance in school, sports, music, growing up in a house where it was shameful to show or talk about your feelings, having a deeply guarded family secret you were or are expected to keep and protect, feeling ashamed from where or how you grew up, how much money you had, what neighborhood you lived in, where you went or didn't go to school, not able to do things as easily as others, parents or caregivers who had unrealistic or perfectionistic expectations of you, being subjected to frequent 
criticism, comparison, or disapproval. Having an absent parent and believing you were unloved or unwanted by them. There probably isn't one of us here or listening in who hasn't felt or isn't carrying shame. And our bodies usually hold our shame. What part of your body would Jesus need to touch to set you free? Free from shame. Free from allowing ourselves to be bowed down rather than holding our heads up high. There's the old spiritual, got a crown up in that kingdom. Ain't that good news? But if our head is bowed down, how can it hold the crown? I invite you to imagine being in the place of the woman, Jesus in the midst of teaching in an apparently crowded synagogue since the news of all the wonderful things he has been doing has spread. He stops. He sees the woman, a woman not wanting to call attention to herself. The Scandinavians among us can relate to that, no? Those differently abled can relate to that. Those who feel themselves a minority can relate to that. Those of us holding on to shame can relate to that. But Jesus calls the whole synagogue's attention to her in order order to speak a word of freedom. You have been set free from whatever ails you. You have been set free from whatever ails you. Raise your heads up. Raise your heads high. And then he touches her in the very place which is the center of her shame. She is naked before all for just a moment before she is raised up, her clothing of shame replaced with the clothing of righteousness and grace. We are crowned with the glory of God. Lift up your heads lest the crown falls off. Hold your head up. Hold it high. As Isaiah says, if you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, these shaming things, then your light shall rise in the darkness. The Lord will guide you continually and make your bones strong. Your ancient ruin shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations, the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. Now, for those of you who are careful listeners, you who are thinking, well, pastor, you're saying shaming is not a good thing, but Jesus puts the synagogue leader and his cohorts to shame. Shame in this case, I would say, is a hopeful thing. Sometimes we need to be chagrined that we have only seen things through our own perspective. Jesus makes the point, you have compassion upon your donkey and your ox and break the Sabbath rule for them, but you don't want to break it for this woman. You unbind your donkeys and your oxen to lead them to water on the Sabbath, but you don't want to unbind this woman who has been bound by Satan for 18 long years. If they hadn't felt shame, had they been callous and dismissive, they would have revealed themselves to be under the influence of Satan. In that way, shame can be a leveler. These powerful men are brought down to be able to see things in a new way, from this no longer bent over woman's way. When we have risen too high, it is gift to be brought to our knees so that we can look another in the face and ask for forgiveness as the synagogue leader one hopes did from the woman. Then, then, we too can hold our heads high. In Jesus' name, amen.